Good afternoon. It sounds like we are ready to get started. My name is Stephanie Hicks and I am the Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Lead for Talent Acquisition within the Office of Human Resources. Uh, in partnership with my colleagues and friends, um, Steve Adams from the NU Changemakers Committee, Review Committee, excuse me, and Al Tillery, the Director of the Center for Diversity and Democracy within um, the Weinberg Center for Arts and Sciences, um, Weinberg College, excuse me, I am messing this up already. Weinberg College for Arts and Sciences. Um, we have partnered to curate this anti-racism and thought and action lecture and discussion series um, throughout the 2021 academic year. And so our idea was that while Changemakers is in a revamp and restore mode, we felt it necessary to really be able to create uh, a space for staff and faculty to have meaningful and interactive discussion around the multiple crisis of race that we face in this country. We are excited for you to join us on this journey. Please participate. We want to hear from you. And um, let's get started. OK, uh, I'm so happy to be here uh, working with uh, my colleagues, Stephanie and Steve, to uh, bring this, uh, this series of, of great talks to you, starting with today's panel on uh, racial politics after the 2020 election. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Changemakers Review Committee. I want to thank the Human Resources Department at NU uh, for providing financial support uh, to the CSDD uh, to partner and run the series. I also want to thank uh, the Graduate School, particularly our colleague Damon Williams, the Assistant Dean of Diversity and Inclusion at TGS, for co-sponsoring this particular panel with us. I can't tell you how excited I am and what a pleasure it is to welcome uh, three of the nation's leading scholars of racial and ethnic politics to share their wisdom with us on this panel today. I'll also say, as I said in the pre-show, three uh, friends of mine that I'm very excited to see uh, in, uh, on Zoom in the pandemic world. Um, I could easily spend the entire hour uh, talking about these three women, giving introductions of their extraordinary credentials, uh, but since this is a power hour, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to have to go with the short form. So I'm going to introduce them in order of their presentations, starting with Candace Watt-Smith, an Associate Professor of Political Science and African American Studies at Pennsylvania State University. Her research focuses on political and po the political and policy ramifications of shifting demographics in the United States. She's the author of numerous articles in the field and her most recent book, Stay Woke, A People's Guide to Making All Black Lives Matter was published by NYU Press in 2019. Next is Sophia Jordan Wallace, an associate professor of political science at the University of Washington. Uh, her research agenda centers on Latino politics, representation, and immigration politics and policy. She too is the author of numerous articles and she's recently published a powerful book on immigration politics titled Walls, Cages and Family Separation, Immigration Politics in the Trump Era with Cambridge University Press. Uh, and last but certainly not least is Natalie Masuoka, an associate professor of political science and Asian American studies at UCLA. Her research focuses on ethnic and racial politics, immigration, political behavior, and public opinion. Again, the author of many, many articles in our field. Uh, she has also written uh, two prize-winning books, most recently, Multiracial Identity Politics in the United States, published in 2017, University Press. Uh, and so I'll turn it over now uh, to our first panelist to give her remarks. Thank you, Al. Thanks for having me. I have to say that um, it really is an honor to have the invitation extended and also to be grouped with Sophia and Natalie, who are amazing scholars, as you've outlined. Um, you know, when the invitation was extended, I was like, yes, like I'm totally in. Also, because by then, uh, we'll know who the president's going to be. We're going to know who's going to control the House and the Senate, and that has not come to pass. Um, but I think that some of the dynamics in this moment are um, instructive, nonetheless. Um, when I think of the question that you all posed, what do I see as the future trajectory of anti-racist politics under the Harris-Biden administration? Um, three questions that I get asked all of the time on a pretty consistent basis came to mind. And I think maybe it would just be fun to, um, to talk a little bit about those and to see what other folks are thinking about them. So one is, 
are we in a racial stasis or are we gonna see racial progress? What's our expectation? Another is, um, is the contemporary movement for black lives successful? Um, and a third is, um, are activists tanking the Democrats by saying defund the police? And to me, these questions tell me more about how people are thinking about politics more than anything else. Um, and I think they highlight what I see as barriers to um, barriers in the path toward um, producing an anti-racist society. So um, first question about stasis or progress. I think people ask me this question because of this book that I wrote with Krista Santi um, entitled Racial Stasis. And what that book essentially says is, is that um, white millennials aren't as progressive as we tend to think that they are. And also that we need to update the way we measure racism to keep up with its evolving logic. Um, in June and July and August, um, people were <laughs> calling me and they're like, you're gonna have to update your book. You know, um, after a nine minute um, film of George Floyd's um, police killing, um, hundreds of multiracial protests across the country and across the globe came, you know, were, you know, enacted. And um, since then, and even since um, the inauguration of um, Trump, more words are becoming household words like intersectionality, anti-racism, white fragility, um, structural racism even, and people are wanting to do diversity training, want to do book clubs. Um, and I think these are all really good, but this kind of energy is really difficult to keep up. And I'm saying this because um, I think it's really important to note a pattern um, around so-called racial progress that has been around in this country for a very long time. And I'm not really sure I expect it to change. Um, and so I, I usually see, we usually see historically that we take some number of steps forward and then we take a few back. And so we've kind of seen that in some ways we can think of, for example, like the implementation of um, the executive order banning critical race theory or trying to put forward patriotic education or um, the fact that most young white Americans voted for Trump. Now, of course your vote is a blunt proxy for your values, but um, we know that most people who voted for Trump are not concerned with or interested in questions of equity. Um, you know, we're arguing about whether black activists are hurting America by dreaming, you know, dreams that are too big um, that other people don't want to dream with them. So I think to, you know, just to be clear, I think that um, anti-racists are always fighting two groups. They are fighting those who don't believe that racism is an issue. And I think that they're also fighting for those against those who think that they're asking for too much um, and who are satisfied with any modicum of change. So, um, you know, there's one group that moves us forward and two that work to either push us back or not to do anything. And so I think it's important for people to make a decision about which group they wanna be in. The second question that comes to mind is, is the Black Lives Matter movement or the contemporary movement for Black Lives successful? Um, and I think unpacking this idea of success um, would be helpful as we think about what to expect moving forward. So what are we measuring when we talk about success? Are we talking about landmark legislation? Are we talking about changing attitudes? Are we talking about a change in conversation? Are we talking about the attainment of a specific measurable goal? Are we talking about movement toward that goal? So I think that's one thing that we need to figure out and get, get on the same page on. The second thing I think that we should consider is um, where are we looking for success? Um, when people ask me if Black Lives Matter is successful, they're asking me to show like congressional receipts. Um, and we like to focus on national politics. Um, you know, we want Congress to do stuff and we should uh, require them to do stuff. But, and I don't wanna let them off the hook, but I really think that um, we should be looking more at the state and local level politics. Um, the matters of policing, prisons, schools, voting, healthcare resource allocation um, are matters that this contemporary movement is concerned with and they occur mostly, um, though not exclusively, but mostly at the local and state level. We've seen bail reform 
Um, across the country, we've seen divestment in prisons and police infrastructure. We've seen the ousting of judges. We've seen citizen initiatives to undo, um, you know, felon disenfranchisement. And these are successes. And they're at the local and state level. Um, and I think that the other thing that we should keep in mind is that um, policymakers can use institutions to blunt these successes and shift outcomes away from what citizens, um, from what citizens intended. So perhaps the question should be, um, what have policymakers done to turn anti-racist preferences of their community into reality? How are policymakers representing constituencies that want to have life-affirming, equitable policy? So I think we should put the onus on the people who have the power to implement policy and allocate resources. And then finally, um, uh, on this question about whether I agree that the slogan defund the police is tanking Democrats. And again, I think that the question itself provides a lot of information. And to me, it's reminiscent of the same question that we asked about six or seven years ago. Is the phrase Black Lives Matter divisive? Um, and so, you know, it took more than a half a decade for people to recognize the wisdom, I think, and contribution that young Black people have and the vision that they have for their lives and others. It's one that's equitable. It's one where people aren't harmed by the state. It's one that does not um, require police in prison because people have the things that they need to thrive. It's one where our ostensibly shared values like egalitarianism are lived out. Um, and so, you know, I'm really curious to know how long it'll take for us to catch up with those who are doing the hard work of envisioning the anti-racist society. The other thing about this slogan, and then I'll stop, is that, um, you know, the question actually focuses on the slogan and not the policy. Um, and so political science, you know, I'm a political scientist. I know that question wording is key. Um, I've actually gotten emails that are like the subject line is like, marketing 101, um, it matters what you call something. And you know, sure, but a majority of Americans, 58% say that major changes are needed in policing. Only 6% of Americans say that no change is needed. I think activists have done their job here. The conversation has changed. People are thinking about the problems and potential solutions to policing. And now the question, I think, is whether policymakers will do their jobs. I'm in the group of people who are pleased with the outcome of this election, but with a caveat. I think elections really just kind of pass existing institutions from one executive to the next, from one Congress to another. But I think the most important aspect of change um, from from the perspective of anti-racist is who your opponent is. And I think that Biden um, will be a more amenable opponent to contend with on really important structural issues. So the upside then um, is that it's a great time to get involved. Thanks. That was great. Thank you so much, Candace. Uh, now we'll have uh, Sophia. Thank you so much. And thank you to Al and everyone at Northwestern. I really appreciate this invitation. And I am, of course, very excited to be in conversation with Candace and Natalie. Um, I'm particularly pleased to have a women of color panel. And so I thank you, Al, for doing that. I think that's important, not just um, because I think that we will have an exciting conversation, but I think it's also important to signal to others that that, that is possible and it is doable. Um, you know, I, I want to start first by, um, you know, kind of responding a little bit to, to Candace's comments to underscore some of the things that she's highlighted that I think are really critical. Um, you know, I think that a lot of our attention should be focused on what is happening at the state and local level and thinking about community activism and organizing. You can't tell a story about 2020 election and not have those pieces. They are critically important on every level in terms of turnout how even electeds have responded to the election outcome, um, what has been the role of say, challenging election results, um, how we're thinking about the Georgia um, runoff. These are all local issues and there are 
uh, there is a key role that everybody plays in these different um, dynamics. And so I think we do need more attention there. And I have long made the argument that, you know, political science needs to really engage social movements on a much more intense, critical level. And you, it is, I think, not really a, an honest intellectual conversation to just dismiss things because you don't like, say, the framing of a slogan or the framing of a movement. I think we need to grapple with, and you know, some of Al's research has really looked at this, you know, how different frames resonate with different groups, um, what they can do. And we also have to expand how we think about what success means, right? On one level, as Candace said, people want these outcomes and in institutions that may or may not be what we see. It could be, as she suggested, whether people are open to change, which sounds like a low bar, but is actually a really high bar for people to come to agreement on that. Um, and I want to use that as a segue to talk a little bit about if we're thinking about sort of policies at the intersection of race um, and politics and thinking about anti-racism, one of the things I think that this election has really shown us and it isn't brand new, but I think it's made it just more salient to all of us now, is really that you know we, we cannot ignore that over 71 million people voted for Donald Trump and what Trump represented. And we're still dealing with, you know, thinking about Candace's points about who is the opponent that you're dealing with and what will be the different um, groups that you are kind of dealing with and trying to move forward with change, we have to grapple with the fact that there is this large segment of the population that did support Trump, did support his policies, did support his rhetoric, and really is operating from a place of, you know, questioning, is there even structural racism? Are there racial disparities in the country? And the reason why that's really important to grapple with is, you know, if you believe what people say about reaching um, agreement and compromise, people have to agree on some basic set of facts. They may agree on outcomes for different reasons, but it's really difficult to think about enacting policies, at least in institutions, if we have a group of individuals, in particular elites um, of a segment, at least, of the Republican Party who doubt and question whether these things are real, right? Whether there is disparate killings of people of color, particularly Black people in this country, what BLM represents, that they make fun of the idea of the fact that there is structural racism and they sort of throw it to the side and say, well, this is the radical left liberals. Rather than disagreement about how you address these problems, we're still having arguments about whether they're even problems. And that presents a different challenge. Candace highlighted another challenge, which is from the left and, and from moderates, whether they want you to be, you know, fine with basically a small change from status quo, as opposed to imagining a much bigger change, right? Um, but I think, you know, we have to really grapple with this and we have to put to bed this idea that the 2016 election was, you know, uh, economic anxiety. You know, we have to face reality that there is a lot of racial attitudes that are driving these issues and anxiety about demographic change and anxiety, frankly, about white loss and really status threat feelings of loss. Um, you know, I think that we have to grapple with that because that's going to be part of what we're up against trying to institute some of these policy change. You know, we have to have honest conversations. And part of it is, I think the human impulse is to turn away from things that are uncomfortable that also say things about us. And, you know, people don't want to grapple with these issues, but we have to grapple with these issues because race isn't going to disappear as a concept, as something that influences people's lives. These problems that our country faces, racial disparities, they're not going to disappear into thin air. And so pretending they don't exist doesn't actually help anything. And so I think we really have to figure out how we're going to deal with that, especially when there's so much misinformation, disinformation, we're operating in an environment where truth is no longer truth. And we know from the people who do work on information, it's really hard to correct that information and change attitudes with correct information. So what are we going to do if a segment of the country fundamentally is receiving news and information 
from news sources that are really mired in misinformation and disinformation. We've already observed Fox News effects on political attitudes for a long time, but that's a totally different thing than if we go into Newsmax and Parler, right? And so I think we have to think about that. I think we also have to take seriously, and race and politics scholars have said this, is what's the reactions of groups who want to reject this stuff and pretend it, I, there's an increasing level of violence that is truly terrifying and not violence by BLM because that's clearly a, uh, you know, a, a way to delegitimize BLM as a movement. I'm talking about violence here by people who are upset that other people want to address racial disparities and fight for racial justice. And they're seemingly increasingly taking to arms and doing all kinds of things, including kidnapping plots. We have to address that for what it is and stop pretending like it's some people upset. It's domestic terrorism to engage in that behavior. Um, and it is a form of racial violence. And so I think we have to grapple with that. Other things that I think you know we need to think about going forward with this election is what can the Biden administration and Biden-Harris administration do? What can they implement? At the forefront, of course, for me is gonna be coronavirus. And part of that is because Coronavirus has amplified what we already know, which is that there's a lot of racial inequities and disparities in this country. And we see this happening in all kinds of ways, whether this is deaths and who's getting sick with the virus, whether it's outcomes in terms of um, educational gaps that are increasing now, racial in, um, gaps, whether it is unemployment, who's disproportionately being affected, the type of sectors that people of color work in and whether that places them in extra harm. And so I see the Biden-Harris administration needing to address a host of policies that are obviously directly related to coronavirus, but then other things like unemployment and education, where they will need to devote a lot of funds, similarly access to healthcare. We have long been talking about access to healthcare, and this is an even more pressing moment, particularly as we see racial disparities. Obviously, the Biden administration needs to address immigration as well as soon as they come in. And some of that can be done regardless of what happens in the Senate runoff race, right? In the sense that uh, Biden can immediately use executive power to stop the wall, stop having kids in cages, stop family separation. You know, he can do a lot of things immediately. He can increase the number of refugees and asylees. Um, you know, he can do a lot of things. Now, what is possible, even at this national policy level, depends a lot on the institutional arrangement. But it doesn't mean we should stop trying. And I completely agree with Candace that it doesn't mean we should stop pushing. And it doesn't mean we should always frame what are the progress that we're looking for in terms of really moderate or minor policy solutions. Of course, I think, you know, racial justice um, policies that are specifically focused on criminal justice um, need to be at the center of what the Biden-Harris administration works on. Whether that comes through Congress, I don't know, because again, it depends on the institutional arrangement, but I think they can use executive power on this issue, and I hope that they do so. Let me um, just stop there and, and, and turn it over. But I mean, clearly, there are a lot of ways that the Biden administration can think, Biden-Harris administration can think about how to use a host of different tools to actually address these issues and not just undo the things that Trump did, but actually move us forward in ways that are actually moving the needle, right? This isn't just about undoing Trump. That was great, such a powerful close. Um, let's turn it over to Natalie. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for the invitation today. It's, um, it's a really exciting opportunity to have a discussion with Candace and Sophia. And what's amazing here is I think we have uh, three people that study race and politics and there is so much going on that I think all three of us are gonna have some wildly different things to think about, um, which I think is on the one hand, um, uh, frustrating, but on the other hand, because given given the topics of what we're talking about, but on the other hand, I think it you know it's it uh, shows you know just how much um, uh, uh, how much we have been dealing with right um, over the last uh, few years. Um, I thought I would pivot to thinking about. Um, I mean, I think, of course, you know, we want to think about the role that white Americans have played in this election. To what extent that this thing, this is a, a marker of a particular type of racial movement moment in history. 
Um, but to pivot a little bit and, and focus on the role that communities of color are playing, right, in um, uh, fighting racism. And, and the first one is, I think sometimes we do focus on, we have a tendency to focus, I think, as political scientists on, you know, public opinion and attitudes and, 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 um, and our belief systems. Uh, but I, what I think what is the most alarming, um, one of the most alarming things that have come out of this election is uh, the attack on voting rights. And so I think, you know, the first thing here is, especially since this is a panel for us to think about policy and policy solutions, um, is to recognize the critical role uh, that government um, and policy play in rectifying racial inequalities in the United States. And I think that we were beginning, coming into a moment that Americans believe that we don't necessarily need redistributive policy, right? That we don't need these policies that we are now post-racial, right? That we have uh, moved so forward that we no longer need, for example, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, um, which was implemented to ensure not only access to the ballot, but also that uh, voters of colors, um, uh, the, the power of voters of color, right, would actually be seen in an election outcome. That sentiment in many ways helped to um, uh, lead to the, uh, the 2013 uh, Shelby County uh, Beholder case, right, which struck down portions of the Voting Rights Act, because the, the belief was, right, is that we are so not, it's not, it's not 1965 anymore, right? We are, we are past Jim Crow, we are past racism. We can look at election outcomes and see uh, Black, Latino, and Asian Americans in elective office, right, as a demonstration that we, are, we have really um, been able to embrace uh, the vote of communities of color. And so the argument was, is that we no longer need it the 1965 Voting Rights Act, right? And so major components of uh, the act were um, deemed um, um, effectively um, unconstitutional. Um, and so now what we're seeing here um, is the uh, implications, right, of, um, of uh, rescinding uh, parts of the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which now allow localities to make their own decisions without federal intervention um, in, in regards to um, election uh, rules um, and various different procedures related to elections. And so now what we are seeing here, especially in this last election, we're seeing it uh, as an as a alarming trend in 2016. And I think it was very clear uh, of what we were seeing for 2020 is that by giving uh, the renewed power to localities to decide uh, their election rules, right? We have things like uh, closures of polling locations, increasing the lines of access, right? Increasing use of things like voter ID uh, laws and various different other types of policies uh, or, or rules uh, that were really discouraging the vote, particularly with a particular target for communities of color, right? Um, and I think that the idea here is that we oftentimes kind of focus on, you know, did did, did uh, voters of color want to vote for Biden or did they want to vote for Democrats, um, et cetera, as if, as if this is really about motivation for communities of color, right? Um, and, and I think what's dangerous here is that we are not at the same time talking about the disenfranchisement of communities of color, right? With a lot of these various different changes because we no longer have the protections of the Voting Rights Act, right? So to focus some of our attention less on attitudes and more about some of these structural and, and, and legal uh, changes that we've seen in the last few years. And that has is distinctively right changed, uh, you can argue changed the course of many, uh, at, especially at the local level to kind of tie in together Candace and, and Sophia's comments about the importance of state and local. Um, that this is in, in particular, right, more so than the president, the, the electoral college, but really in particular for, um, uh, uh, local races, which, as we know, um, have uh, very clear impacts. Um, the other thing that I thought I would say uh, for 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 you know our conversation today is to also think about um, um, you know really ensuring that for communities of color they also understand the importance of redistributive policy, right? And to not assume that just necessarily because they're communities of color, that they're gonna automatically understand why do we need redistributive policies? What's the role of, the, of, of government, right? Why are some of these things important? Um, because I think what we saw in California is that 
uh, we don't necessarily automatically see a progressive vote amongst communities of color. Uh, in uh, one of the state initiatives that was put on the ballot here in California uh, was uh, Proposition 19, which thought to re-implement affirmative action in public university applications and uh, public service hiring. Uh, and it was believed by activists that this was our moment, right? That there were um, strong <clears throat> and a powerful voting bloc uh, by Latino, Asian American and, and black voters in California with their growth in the population and their growth in terms of their proportion of the electorate, you know, that they were, we were seeing a possible progressive movement. And so they thought that this was a moment, right, to put affirmative action back on the ballot to reinstate it back in California. Uh, which was um, outlawed um, in 96 uh, with Prop 209. Um, and what happened, unfortunately, is by a pretty decent margin, uh, Californians voted to not re-implement um, affirmative action um, in the state. Um, and part of that, um, so the, this opposition uh, was carried uh, by, in particular, Asian American and Latino voters, right? And so this, I think, is an important conversation for those of us who study communities of color, right? That what we do want to, uh, you know, think about the role um, of um, white electorates. I think we also have a responsibility to think about how uh, we can effectively communicate to communities of color, right, the importance of some of these various different policies out there. Because do I believe that communities of color are actually against affirmative action? No. Uh, I think that what, the, what we saw here in California was the failure, right, for us to clearly articulate why we need intervention, right, at, at, at a government level. Because I think that that's in some ways fundamentally, you know, really what's here at stake and why, right, historically, um, the ideas, the progressive ideas of redistribution, right, are critical, that they're not necessarily an attack on someone's merit or hard work, right, but in fact really are central to the structural nature of racism uh, that are deeply uh, embedded um, in not only um, our political practices, but I think in, 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 in many ways in, in um, deeply in, in um, how we socially engage with one another. So I think those are two comments here that we can um, uh, add to the to our discussion here. Wow, that was great. Such a really important and nuanced point. So um, I think that um, we are going to be ready to move into the Q&A phase. Uh, and so I see that uh, our moderators uh, for the Q&A are are, are searching the, the, the function and um, uh, I, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll turn it over there. Uh, we are ready to go ahead and get started. I have my first question. Okay. And all of the panelists can feel free to address if necessary. Um, so Republican President Donald Trump's administration was successfully able to resume capital punishment, ending a de facto moratorium by his Democratic predecessor Barack Obama amid legal challenges and difficulties obtaining lethal injection drugs. How do you see today's scheduled execution of Brandon Bernard as another example of the role race plays in capital punishment? I'll, I'll start if you don't mind. Um, I just actually was reading a paper um, by Frank Baumgartner, one of my uh, colleagues, one of our colleagues at um, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, I can't remember the co-author's name, but one of the things that they outline is that um, we tended to see uh, capital punishment put in places where there were a lot of lynchings. And so historically, capital punishment was like a legal substitution for um, extrajudicial lynchings. And so places where we see capital punishment um, implemented, it kind of stayed around for a long time and took off. And in places where it was never implemented, um, it, it just, it, it never took off. And so um, to Monica's question, right, even just the history of how we see um, capital punishment implemented. Um, and over time, you know, policy telegraphs messages to us. Um, and it tells us that, yeah, if we're doing something, if we're treating a person a certain kind of way, they're probably getting what they deserve. And it becomes common sense to us that we should treat certain people certain ways. So I think that what we're seeing here is um, just kind of a, a very long legacy 
of, of racialized um, and racist policies that have evolved over time. The reasons why we give uh, have evolved over time, but they're still rooted um, in, in the same, in that exact same racist history. Yeah, I'll just add to that. Um, I agree with Candace, but I, I also think that, you know, this is, an, it, it, Trump really relishes in sort of the spectacularity of cruelty. Um, you know, that is a defining feature of a lot of his racialized policies. And I think that there is a lot of empirical evidence that the application of the death penalty is deeply racialized. And we know that there's serious racial disparities. Um, that is indeed why there are so many state, one of the main reasons why there's so many state moratoriums on the death penalty. Um, I think that it is also a huge violation of norms to resume executions um, during this lame duck period before president um, you know, leaves. We do have norms, obviously Trump is a norm breaker, um, but it is wild to move forward with five executions in this period between the election and when he leaves office. Um, and I think it, it, it's truly cruel. And I, I ask the question that I keep asking, which is why is the president spending his time and energy on these things and directing the administration to focus on this? Meanwhile, 3000 people have died at yesterday, more than 3000 people from the coronavirus and we still haven't heard from the president in any regular way about the increasing severity of the coronavirus um, in this moment. I mean, it, it's just a complete distortion of what is what should be a focus if we care about humanity. Thank you, Candace and Sophia. Um, Natalie? Um, I, I think you know the, that that's a the, that final point by Sophia. I think is just a really excellent one. I mean, I, you know, I think that the idea here is is that there are so many um, uh, challenges that more Americans uh, really need addressed today. I think than some of these symbolic, you know, I think you could argue as these kind of symbolic attempts, right, by um, national leaders to redirect the conversation um, away, which is is many ways counterproductive. Awesome, thank you. All right, we have our next question from Cindy. What do you think about the new 110 startup? I know very little about this program. My understanding is that there's an initiative among uh, a, a, a group of CEOs that are planning to create um, like a million jobs uh, in 10 years. Americans, yes. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I, I mean, I think that it's important. <laughs> um, I can go about 10 different ways with this. You know what? I'm, I'll answer a different question, maybe slightly. I think that um, one of the things that we've seen, um, Tressie McMillan Cotton in Lower Ed writes about this really beautifully. And she talks about the ways that over the past several decades, um, companies have essentially offloaded um, training to their employees, to, right? That it used to be that you could go to a company at, in high school, at a high school with no diploma and work your way up. And the company would pay for you to get, uh, you know, uh, training, more education. And over the years, that responsibility has been given to the, uh, the public, right? To employees, which means that people are racking up student debt, that they are, um, you know, getting all of these, like sometimes are getting themselves involved with for-profit institutions that are not actually out to help them. So on the one hand, I think that, sure, I think that's great that if there are companies that are un, like willing to, um, to do this work, to bring back that responsibility, I think that's good. Um, but I, I, I think that it's interesting that a group has to come together to say that we're gonna hire one, you know, some some number of black employees, there are people who, right? The black unemployment rate has always been twice the the rate of white unemployment, which means that there are twice as many, right? I mean, not twice as many, but twice the rate of people who are looking for jobs. I'm I'm I think I'm some ways unclear why they need an initiative instead of just doing right. 
by applicants. There are plenty of excellent applicants across education, across, you know, um, you know, uh, sectors that are perfectly, uh, you know, able to, to do excellent work. That's me being cynical. I'm on a cynical day today. <laughs> I, I, I think I'll add, I'll add a note, uh, just one point, uh, even though I'm just the moderator, is, is that, you know, I think that, you know, the, the initiative really speaks to the politics that Candace, Natalie, and Sophia have threaded together uh, for us today on the panel in the sense that these kinds of racial justice movements ebb and flow. And what we've seen coming out of the summer, right, is that the corporate sector uh, has been way ahead of the government sector, right? And so the extent to which, you know, the announcement of these initiatives, which, you know, they reflect the reality that we live in a spatially segregated society, right? When you take all the things that people like, you know, Linda Williams and Ira Katz Nelson and, and our field have written about the modern making of, you know, middle-class America and the spatial isolation of, you know, uh, black Americans in particular, but also other peoples of color, you know, the kind of need to announce the initiative in the transition space between Trump, whom Candace, you pointed out was hostile to any multiracial uh, movement forward with his executive order banning diversity training, right? To kind of, you know, signal to Biden in the middle of this, um, uh, you know, transition that this is something that corporate leaders, you know, uh, wanna move on. I think that, you know, at best, it's something that activists uh, that we all study can exploit, right? If they have a kind of, of mind to, right? This is where they can go for funding for initiatives. This is where they can go to, you know, place leverage points on conservative politicians in the Democratic Party. So, I mean, that's what I see the, as the real potential of it. Um, And, and just maybe uh, one final point on that. I, I don't know uh, a lot about this, this specific initiative, but I think um, it does, um, it's kind of consistent to me with what's going on, which is that I think one, the amazing impact of um, the Black Lives Movement to generate a conversation um, across a lot of different sectors, right? Not necessarily just say for like, at colleges, but in the corporate sector and all of the various different, various different other uh, um, occupational sectors out there where they're talking about diversity, the importance of diversity, I think does speak to the impact of it. Um, however, I think I would like to note that, um, you know, this is one of the kind of problematic, some of the problematic, uh, I think, po points of, of partially what as Candace is pointing out, which is that, you know, there is then you know, this idea that um, corporations uh, or leaders can do kind of one, they can make kind of one change uh, and advertise this kind of one change that they're doing in this moment to address a uh, public conversation, um, but then don't really think about a more systemic um, or longer term change to rectify racial inequality. Right. And so, you know, this, they're, they're, they're in some ways is a little bit almost like, you know, kind of a, it's like a, a, a part of the waxing and waning, but it does have a, a little bit of the air of like a, 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 um, a fad, right? That this is like something that people feel that they want to do now. They're going to address it, you know, in this only in this kind of one contemporary period. Um, but I think that it's important for us to really push that, you know, if we really ex feel that people are, are, are um, standing behind the discourse that Black Lives Matter um, has raised for us is that we want structural um, and, and, and um, deeper uh, institutionalized change, uh, right? So not necessarily something that is uh, event specific. It's also true that they're, they're not just being nice, right? I mean, you know, like the, 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 the population's contracting. Uh, Mr. Trump has broken the immigration flow that, you know, Obama started to break, right? And so the question of whether people are gonna be able to get low cost labor so for, for part of their corporate cog, right, is an open one <laughs> as we go. So, so part of this is like, you know, they're also responding to their own profit motivations, right? Uh, I guess the only point I was making is, you know, I'm kind of a Derek Bell guy, like let's use that little interest convergence and kick the door open, right? For the structural things that you're talking about, Natalie, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I guess just to, just one more thing on this thing. I just would like, I, I would be really interested to see, for example, if the jobs are going to be across the company, is it going to be 
mostly workers? Is it going to be mostly middle management? Are there going to be any changes to the boards? Is it going to be, you know, so these, I suppose, are just questions that I would have that I think would be important to know the answers to, to make an assessment about it. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. Ashley says, fabulous panel. This relates to Sophia's talk. Talking about the Biden-Harris initiative around COVID-19, what are um, some of the panelists' thoughts on how the healthcare system and political system should approach the mistrust of, bi of vaccines from BIPOC communities? Medical and research initiatives have done immense harm to BIPOC communities and why there is distrust. And I am, and I am curious um, about the panel's feedback on how to approach up upcoming vaccines. So, um, you know, thank you for that question. I mean, I think that, um, I think there's an impulse by some people in the public and public rhetoric to dismiss concerns that people have and pretend that those individuals are anti-science. While I think that that m does motivate some individuals, um, I think that among community of color, um, they are very, very aware of ways in which the healthcare system and different studies, thinking about Tuskegee, thinking about de you know sterilization campaigns that have just you know really targeted women of color in different parts of this country and even maybe in, for example, in Latinos in their home country, right? Um, if they if they immigrated to this country, I, I don't th I think this is smart to be aware of that history and that is to have knowledge. I don't think it means that it is impossible to convince people to take the vaccine. But what I do think is we have to acknowledge real harms have occurred and it is worth it then to address what are the steps being taken to make sure that those harms don't happen again. And you have to actually reach out to those communities. So similarly, earlier, Natalie made the point that you have to actually engage these communities directly. And we need to think about it rather than dismiss it. We need to have forums. We need to present evidence. I know that Dr. Fauci has started to already do some outreach on this. And I think one of the key things here is that we know that one of the most important things with public health is communicating with the public and consistent information. Unfortunately, we haven't had that under this administration. I think there will be a very significant change under the Biden-Harris administration, where we'll have a lot more consistent information, including information about the vaccine in terms of how, how safe it is, what kinds of tests they've done, but also what to expect from the vaccine, right? Thinking about how people will feel after they're administered the shot. All of these things have to be said at the outset so that people have the correct expectations. And we don't have, for example, a, a normal reaction to the vaccine instilling fear in different segments of communities because then people are really worried, did something wrong happen as opposed to that was the normal anticipated reaction. So communication here is critical and addressing these things head on in terms of mistrust. I really think that that has to be at the forefront. We really cannot dismiss that. Thank you, Sophia. So we are going to, um, as much as we would love to sit and answer all of the questions and their fabulous questions, we do have to shift to close. Um, Steve, I'm going to turn it over to you. Actually, I think it's going to come to come to me first, Stephanie. And, and, and I just want to say thank you to our three brilliant panelists for sharing their time with us. Thank you to Stephanie and Steve for envisioning this amazing series. I think this has been just a wonderful start. Uh, and now we'll turn it over to Steve, who is going to uh, sort of really take up that thought and action part of our title. So Steve. Um. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks to each of our panelists. Thanks to Al, Stephanie. Um, um, it's been a great event so far. And um, I wanna encourage us to um, begin, begin to think about um, what actions we can take. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen. Just give me one second. Okay, so uh, those of you who are familiar with the Changemakers program um, know that it is focused on both um, self work and um, community work, you know what what is it that we can do to um, create change in our communities around these issues? Um, it would be difficult to difficult to overstate the importance of doing transformative self work 
um, related to the issues our panelists have highlighted today. Um, this is a time where it could be tempting for us to focus on what others can do to create change. And so first around thought, um, we, um, I would like to encourage all of you, um, and again, this is a thought in action um, um, series. We're gonna have panels, we'll have talks, but in between them, um, we'd like you to do a little bit of self work to create the change you want to see, right? And um, first I want you to do some thinking about um, one issue at the intersection of race and politics about which you would like to see social change. So community policing, policing is a good example. Um, and th there are several others we we've talked about quite a few today. Um, number one, do you know all of your elected local, state, county, and federal um, officials? Do you know who they are? Um, and do your positions, you know, on the issue that you choose, I mean, you could choose several issues, but then the next step will be a bit harder. Um, um, you know, do your positions differ from those of your elected officials? How um, would your officials vote on or, um, something related to um, community policing and any change, or, you know, around um, um, justice in our communities? Um, so do some thinking about that. And then um, between now and the next event, um, take action. Um, find out um, where your election, elected officials stand on the issue. Some of this um, can be found through news stories. Um, as a librarian, I um, you know, encourage you to use the library, use the internet, use, do what you have to do to find out. But if you need to, maybe this will be the subject of the next step. And that is you know, writing um, one representative at each level, um, again, federal, um, sorry, local, uh, county, federal, and state, um, to let them know your position. Um, and as a bonus, hey, write them all, um, get involved. Um, how, you know, the political scientists can um, give a better sense of um, what actually works. But um, we know that when a representative um, sees that it's important um, to his or her district or state um, that a particular issue get attention, um, you know, eventually um, the tide turns. So I'm encouraging all of us to jump in and participate in that work. Um, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention for attending um, this event today. Um, our next event will be on Je um, January 26th and the topic will be um, racial disparities um, in the response to COVID-19. We'll have some panelists, details about that event will be sent out soon. Um, I believe we have the registration information for everyone um, who registered today, so we'll send it out, but it will be promoted by the same means um, we promoted it before, so you'll see it again through those channels. Um, thanks um, to everyone for um, your time and energy and attention, um, for your thought and for your action. Thank you.